Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at Wesley. My name is Pastor Sylvia Harris, and as always, it is a joy and an honor to be with you. As a reminder, take the time to please fill out the attendance prayer cards that are in your bulletin. Um, they can be placed in the various offering plates at the end of the service. I enjoy very much knowing what's going on in your lives that I can be in prayer for with you throughout the week. So please take a moment and write down what's going on in your life to share with me, please. The plates, of course, remain at the front and the back of the sanctuary. I'm not sure that we will ever again resume passing them, but we continue to leave them there because, as you know, the pandemic is continuing. Um, I'm going to take a moment to just do a public service announcement. If you have not gotten vaccinated and it's safe for you to do so, please do so. If it's been more than six months since you were vaccinated, please get your booster shot. It is the best way for all of us to stay safe and to see an end to the ongoing ravages and problems of COVID. Um, you know, I, I'm thrilled to say that our children were able to get their first vaccine shots finally this week. Um, and my husband and I are gonna be going to get our boosters. So I'm not asking anything of you that we don't do ourselves. So that's my little public service announcement. Thank you for indulging me. Um, there is once again, a copy of the Breakthrough Prayer in your bulletins this week you did not get a copy of that last week it is in there for you please be in prayer with us so that we can see exactly what it is that God has in store for us as the people of Wesley looking at the upcoming events in the life of the church next Saturday the Saturday after Thanksgiving we are going to be meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning to decorate the sanctuary because next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. I am really excited to see the church decorated and to fellowship over the coming month with everybody as we look forward to the arrival of Christ. Also coming up next Monday, I've been saying it for a while now, but next Monday, November 29th, is our annual charge conference. We do have a Zoom link available for those of you who cannot be here in person. It's a 6.30 meeting on a Monday night. And so I know between work and travel at night, not everybody is going to be able to come in person, but everybody can still participate. So please either let myself or Camilla Windsor know if you need that Zoom information and we will get that for you so that you can all participate. We continue to collect toys and donations in partnership with the No Dreams Lost Foundation um, so that we can participate with them in giving out toys for Toys for Tots. We are accepting those donations and um, we'll do that for the first Sunday of December. And then we are scheduled to wrap presents with them if you're available on December 17th and 18th. And then the toy distribution will be right out of our um, education building over here. And that distribution is going to take place December 21st to the 23rd. If you're interested in participating in any of this, please let me know so that we can plan and schedule accordingly. Also in the life of the church, uh, Ms. Rosalind Gordon has tickets for sale for the fashion show that she is doing on December the 11th. She is doing this in partnership with our upcoming anniversary. Um, it's gonna be held at East Lake Park from two to four in the afternoon on December the 11th, that's a Saturday. So please see her for tickets. Also, if you know anybody who may be interested in walking in the fashion show, please see her. Um, the clothes that are being worn are donated through that same um, No Dreams Lost Foundation and they are available for the people who walk in the show to keep afterwards. Um, it's part of an outreach ministry to help those who need help as far as that goes with clothing and such. Um, so please see Ms. Rosalind Gordon if you have any questions or are interested in uh, purchasing tickets or being involved in that. And speaking of the anniversary of Wesley, um, you guys know this better than I do, I'm sure, um, but the anniversary is always celebrated on the second Sunday of December. So that's right around the corner. And we are going to have a choir or a quartet or a duet singing that day, however many of you want to participate in the music of that day. Uh, Ms. Donna Pivard has agreed to lead that 
And so there will be rehearsal the next two Sundays. So on the 28th of November and on the 5th of December following worship service, she will lead rehearsal so that we are ready to sing a joyful noise on our anniversary Sunday. So please see her if you have any questions about that. And then also, um, I believe Miss Patty Kirkendall is in charge of the fellowship time on that Sunday. Does that sound right? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so if you're interested in helping with the fellowship um, plans for Sunday, December the 12th after worship, we're gonna have time of fellowship. So please see Miss Patty Kirkendall to see what kind of help she may need with those events. So those are my announcements this morning. Um, there is one slight typo in the bulletin. When you look for our opening song, it says the wrong song number. It is standing on the promises, but that's going to be number 354 in your um, hymnal. Just make that note as we join in our call to worship with Miss Agatha. Good morning, church. Good morning. Can we all stand and do the God's worship? Loving God of power and justice and peace, in our broken world, we seek a new order. Where there is courage to speak the truth to power, we seek a new order. Where there is mutual support in church and community, we seek your order. Where there is abundant time for healing, we seek a new order. Where there is peace and freedom for all, our opening theme is in three.
God of in prayer together. God of grace, love, power, and justice. You deliver your son into this world to testify to the truth. Mobilize us. Give us the nerve to continuously take up the project of deliberation like Christ the King. Give us the courage to eagerly respond to your call to advocate for justice and peace in our communities so that the oppressed will be set free. It is because of the Spirit that gives each one of the sustenance needed to do this our work. Daniel, which you shall find in page 8 to 8, Daniel 7, 9 to 10, and 13 to 14. Page 8 to 8, Daniel 7, 9 to 10, 13 to 14. Judgments before the ancients one. As I watched them, we are setting the table. And an ancient one took his stone. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fairly thin, and its wheels were burning fire. A steam of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousand servants, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood attending him. The court is judgments and the books were opened. 13 to 14. As I watched in the night vision, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the ancient one and was present before him, was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship. That all peoples, nations, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall never be destroyed. A New Testament reading is taken from Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. Find the New Testament on page 244. John to the seven churches that were in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming with the cloud. Every eye is to see him. Even those who pierce him and on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wait. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the mighty Almighty. This has been the word of God for the people of God. And all God's children said, thanks be to God. Would you please join with me in a moment of prayer? To the one who is and was and is to come, we come before you this day asking that the words of my mouth and the meditations of the hearts and minds of all those hearing my voice be acceptable and pleasing in your sight for you alone are the Alpha and Omega. 
Amen. So last week, we talked about the questions we have and the answers that we want, right? How we want to know how much longer we are going to have to suffer with what is in front of us. When will the relationship I've been praying about be better? And when will this pandemic finally be over? And when, Lord, when will there actually be justice in this world? When will there be equity among all people? where standards of right and wrong are no longer influenced by our implicit biases. Put another way, when will the scales of justice be truly blind, truly righteous for all people? So that justice is not meted out in some way for some and in other ways for others. When will this age, this interminable separation from the Messiah, from Yahweh, the separation from the God we worship and trust and love, when will that separation be no more? When will the final age be here? And what we said about the wind to all of these questions, about the timing, about how much longer we have to hold on in a world where injustice and oppression continue to be the tools of the powerful, the weapons wielded by those favored in these societal double standards. We said that we needed to hold on just a little bit longer. Hold on and keep fighting the good fight Keep being the hands and feet of Christ in the world. Keep living out the gospel, co-creating the kingdom of God on earth, because in the end, the cross did not win. In the end, the evils, the spiritual forces of wickedness, the human-driven isms that plague the daily life of so many, those things that play out publicly in the news reports and the legal double standards that we see daily in the world around us. In the end, those things do not win. They do not have the final say. In the end, the empire could not overcome the movement of a poor rabbi A poor rabbi, born on the wrong side of the Sea of Galilee. In the end, the power of the Holy Spirit, the very power that we claim in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ, in the end, the power of the Holy Spirit of the Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, in the end, that is the power that defeated the cross, that raised Christ from the dead. And so in the end, even as the headlines around us scream that injustice continues, that equity continues to be denied, that humanity continues to feed its own desires, its own wants, its own individually driven greed and self-serving ideologies. In the end, my friends, we continue to choose to hold on to the truth that the cross does not have the final say because we hold on to our faith and we choose to live differently than the world around us because we trust our God. Keep this in mind. Keep in mind the truth that as we step into this morning's message, the cross is never the end. It is just the beginning. 
It is the beginning of the reign of Christ. And on this Sunday, which the church recognizes as the reign of Christ Sunday, we sit in this space trusting the truth that Christ is already reigning over this earth. And so now, as we look to the reading of Revelation, keep that in your hearts. Keep that in your minds. The book that we call Revelation is titled The Revelation to John. And it was written around the end of the first century by an author who tells us that his name is John and that he is writing from the island of Patmos. Church tradition has long held that this was, in fact, the Apostle John, the son of one of the sons of Zebedee, um, and many believe that he was, in fact, the beloved disciple who stood at the foot of the cross as Christ was killed, who stood at the foot of the cross and took over the care of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Church tradition holds that this same Apostle John was the only one of the twelve to live into old age, the rest having been martyred through the course of their lifetime. He was likely the youngest of the twelve, and so it is quite likely that this is in fact the author of the book of Revelation. He is on the island of Patmos, he tells us in the text, because of his witnessing of his faith. And in the letter, if you're at all familiar with the letter of Revelation, it is full of these fantastic visions of what we call apocalyptic literature. Revelation is a text that is in many ways very similar to the prophet Daniel's text in the Old Testament. They are the only two books that we identify actually as being apocalyptic. And the word apocalypse actually means, in the original language, uncovering or revealing of something. So the challenge that we have when we read these texts is that we know they are uncovering, they are revealing some truth to us. But the reality is of what they write, it's so fantastical. It is so impossible to grasp and understand. There is figurative language, metaphor upon simile, and images, beasts, and dragons, and throne rooms. People have tried throughout the millennia to nail down these texts and make them mean something specific. They try to make them about something specific about eternity sometimes. And, and that can be understandable because the truth of this image of a multi-headed dragon and Christ coming with a sword in his mouth as the way he is going to fight the battle of the end and the whore of Babylon thrown in the mix, it all sounds like some kind of Hollywood fantasy. Others try to interpret the text as being purely political or revolutionary against the empire of Rome. And that can have some sort of comfort, I suppose, because then it's not this literal dragon and how many headed beast kind of thing, but rather figurative only. But to try to interpret this text of Revelation as only political or only end of days oriented, it leaves us, as we sit here in the 21st century, at somewhat of a loss of what to do. I want you to understand that Daniel, the text that we know as Daniel, it was written during the time of the Maccabean Revolt, and that was around 167 to 160 BCE, so, so 160 or so years before Christ was born. The Jews were revolting against the Hellenistic influences of what was the Seleucid Empire. It was a Greco empire, and they were revolting against it because they lived under political and religious oppression and torment during that time, and that was the time that Daniel wrote his apocalyptic text. And Revelation was written when the early church was under direct persecution by the Roman Empire. There was political, economic, social, and religious persecution that was a threat to the daily lives of the followers of Christ. Both of these texts were written at times when equity 
wasn't even a dream, let alone something that people could reach out and try to grasp. These texts were written by people who lived on the margins, who were persecuted daily, and lived in a very real state of fear of violence against their lives. Oppressive powers were the day's norm when these texts were written. Keeping in mind the persecution, dehumanization, and unjust reality of life, let us hear again how John opens his letter to the seven churches in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Seven is the perfect number in scripture. It symbolizes perfection, wholeness, completeness. And so the seven spirits who are before the throne of the one who was and is and is to come, we know that the one who is on this throne is perfect, is whole, is complete. The one I am writing to you from, the one we serve and worship, sits on a throne that is higher than all the thrones of this world. The powers and principalities, the empire where Caesar rules, the empire where elected officials are more worried about job security than the people they represent, the empire where laws are written loosely enough and applied then in biased form, the empire where the powers and principalities that pass and enact laws do so to keep the power with few and continue the oppression of many. Even in that world of unjust empires, all of those powers and principalities are under the throne of the one who was and is and is to come. The one who is complete and perfect. That is how John starts his letter. And that is how we need to start understanding our own world. Even as it looks like there are forces in control, people and puppets who are seemingly so important in this world, the reality is that the perfect one sits on a throne above and beyond and over it all. Then John gives us all of these titles of Jesus. All of these reminders for us of who Christ is. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. The faithful witness. Jesus Christ faithfully witnessed, faithfully lived a life that honored and glorified the Creator in heaven. The faithful witness of his life was because he dedicated his life to freeing the oppressed, to releasing the captives, to healing the sick and helping the poor. Jesus faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. The cross did not win, and the powers of this world still cannot win, because Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the dead, my friends. This is the truth. This is the power of the Holy Spirit of the same one who sits on that throne. The firstborn of the dead is the foundation of our hope. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Not only is the one who is and 
was and is to come, sitting high on that throne. Also, Jesus Christ is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Ultimately, whatever you take away from this message today, remember always that Jesus Christ is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Because Jesus Christ reigns. There's more. To him who loved and freed us from sin by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priest serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. To him. To Christ, who loves and frees us. Christ loves and frees us from sin, from bondage, from the powers and principalities of this world. Christ loves and frees us just as we are in our brokenness, in our sinfulness, in our seemingly hopeless, overwhelming state of being. Christ Jesus loves and frees us. Not only that, Christ makes us into a kingdom, into priests. We are all of us, every single one of us sitting here, every single one hearing this, we are all priests, my friends. We are all worthy. We are all priests worthy in serving God Almighty. As I stand here and I preach and you call me pastor because that's the tradition of what we call the one who preaches and teaches. Yes, that is true. But I am not the only one. We are all priests of the Most High God. We are all priests serving the Almighty. Let that truth wash over you and bless you. You are a priest worthy of serving the Most High. And how? Do we as priests serve the Most High God? We serve by being faithful witnesses, just like Jesus Christ. We serve by living into the gospel daily, seeking ways to release the captives, to free the oppressed, to heal the sick, to empower and bring relief to the poor. We serve as priests by witnessing our faith in the daily activities of our lives, in ways both big and small, as we seek to live in to the truth of the gospel we proclaim. This is all what John was reminding the seven churches in Asia in his greeting, in his opening of this letter we call Revelation. The rest of the, of the book, the details that show the chaos and the visions, the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the trumpets and the robes and the dragons, they're all plump in comparison. These visions of chaos are there because chaos is what the world will be in until the end of days. These visions of evil, of rulers who abuse their power, of unjust practices and self-serving ways of humanity, these visions speak to every age because humanity continues to live in service to itself. 
Now, I don't know if John of Patmos had this in mind, had this truth in mind when he wrote this letter, or if there was truly a coding of political dissidents that he was writing, or if these fantastically horrible events will actually unfold. I don't know if he knew all of what he wrote would be interpreted over the millennia in so many different ways. The truth, though, the foundation of what he wrote about was grounded in this greeting of who he was writing for. The perfect God. Our perfect God. The one who is and was and is to come. Jesus Christ, who loves and frees us, who was and is the faithful witness, who rose from the dead and is the firstborn of the dead, who is the foundation of our hope, Jesus Christ, ruler of the kings of the earth. And not only does John ground his letter in these truths, he goes on to declare something that we recognize as so important in our faith. Look, he is coming with the clouds. John doesn't say he will come with the clouds. What John says, what we hear is, look, he is coming. He is coming. It's happening now. God's timing is never our timing. We know this truth in our hearts, within our souls. We know in the very fiber of our being, that God's ways are beyond what we can ever fully comprehend. But even still, we can understand this piece of truth, that Christ is coming. It's happening now. This is not something for us to wait on, for a rapture to occur, for peace to suddenly be realized, or for total chaos, more so than we see, to break out. There is not a place or a point for us to pick apart and say, ah, yes, now the conditions are right. Because it is already happening. Christ is coming. The ruler of the kings of this earth is coming, my friend. The just one, the one who will enact equity and justice for all, is coming. Christ is already reigning over this creation. The sin, the inequity, the evils, the unfair treatment, the implicit biases that keep so many oppressed for the benefit of a few. Unjust laws, unfair business practices, self-serving political powers, they're all coming to an end because they cannot remain when Christ is coming. They cannot remain in the reign of the just one in this world. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and on his account all the tribes of the earth will wail. There is no hiding from this, my friends. There is no escaping. In the end, Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. 
even those who walk their own way, who seek their own gain, and who fail to act with humanity toward all of creation. And so what do we do, my friends, as the ones who hear this truth, as the ones who understand that Christ is already reigning today? We stay faithful in our witness, in our acts of justice, in behaving with human decency, in our actions that seek change to a distorted legal system, and our help for the poor, that they may have the resources that they need to not just survive, but to and our help for those with mental illness, that they may have fullness of life. And our care for our loved ones, that they may know God's grace through us. So many ways, big and small, we don't have time to name them all. We are called to live in such a way that we show the world the reign of Christ through our actions, through our actions through the way we love and show mercy and grace. Apocalypse, in the original language, as I said earlier, it means to uncover or reveal. We are living in the time of the apocalypse now. The time for us to uncover for us to reveal the truth of the gospel as a living and breathing way of life. It is up to us, my friends. It is up to us to uncover the truth that Christ is reigning over all the earth. That we are the hands and feet that act for justice, that live in grace, that show up with intentional, direct, unconditional love for all. We do this because we are grounded in the hope of the Alpha and the Omega, of the one who is and was and is to come. Because Christ is coming, and that is the best news. If you would please turn in your bulletin and we have our song of response also on printed there. You may remain seated as we sing through. <laughs> is more true 
than the reality of your returning reign. Forgive us, we pray, for being caught up in the chaos, in the power struggles, in the unjust and unfair actions and activities of this world. Forgive us for failing to rest in the assurances of your awesomeness, in the assurances of your love and saving grace. Forgive us for failing to live lives focused on the cross, on the purposes of our faith as living examples of your reign in this world. Empower us, Lord, that we may be your hands and feet. Embolden us, Lord, that we may speak your truth when the powers and principalities of this world seek to silence us. Enliven us, Lord, that we may dance with joy and shout with praise the wondrous love that you have for all creation. We are weary in our hearts and in our bodies, beaten down by the challenges of this world. Cancer, the legal system, job stress, aging causing our bodies to change seemingly overnight, broken relationships, and on and on the list goes of the worries and challenges, heartaches and pains of this world. Help us to lay our burdens down, to put them at the foot of the cross, where you make all things new. Help us to take up your yoke and to rest in the comfort you provide, knowing that even though the road is not easy and the answers are not the ones we like, that when we rest in you, we are grounded and assured of truths beyond this world. Lord, we live in a system that benefits some while harming and hurting and keeping oppressed so many. Help us that we may be agents of change, of love and grace and mercy, who not only speak truth to power, but also act justly to change the systems to change what is keeping oppressed and unjust actions the norm in this world. Lord, we pray for our leaders. We pray that they may realize the greater good is more important than pandering to political bases or special interest lobbyists. We pray that our political leaders can recognize humanity above all else, seeking ways that benefit the greatest good for all creation. There are prayers and praises, hopes and concerns in the hearts and minds of those hearing my voice. We lift those to you both silently and aloud. Jesus Christ who is coming. Jesus Christ who is reigning over all creation. We ask that in your mercy you hear our prayers and guide our lives that we may hear your answers. As we pray together now the prayer that you taught saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite you to please stand as you are able to join in our closing hymn, Standing on the Promises.
stand on those promises of Christ our King, knowing that he is reigning now and forevermore. As you go out into the world this week, go knowing that not only is Christ reigning, but know that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit go with you and love you in everything you do, always. Amen. Amen.